So welcome again. My name is Elizabeth Karcher and I'm the executive director of the Woodrow Wilson House. We're located at 2340 S Street in Washington, DC. And during COVID, we've opened our, uh, our garden to a new exhibition and we've opened our virtual uh, online video to do these talks on Tuesdays. Um, so let me tell you a little bit what's happening at the Wilson House now. As I mentioned, we've got Suffrage Outside. It's an exhibition in the rear garden and uh, it will be running through November 1st. So please, make a reservation. It's all COVID safe in that we've got sanitizer out and available. There is social distancing. Uh, this, the exhibition is, um, you'll go through the garage, not through the house. Um, so please make a reservation. We have limited time slots for our guests to come and be outdoors in the garden to see the exhibition and we welcome you. It's open seven days a week. So I'm sure there's a time to find a slot and come by to the Wilson House to see that. While you're there, stop by the front garden, which is our victory garden, which started uh, the idea of creating the Suffrage Outside exhibition. Bring your scissors, snip some of the herbs from the victory garden. Um, it will almost be, it's now fall, so that garden will be turning over shortly. So please take some herbs when you go. We welcome you uh, to, to take something uh, when you come visit. The other uh, events that we have going on at the Wilson House, um, as a response to COVID, we started and uh, to do these outdoor walking tours. And now that the weather is cool, we are promoting those. We have two walking tours available. One is the Wadi Butler Wood walking tour. It's called If These Walls Could Talk. It's about the people uh, that lived in the buildings and the houses in the Calorama neighborhood that were uh, the, uh, in the houses that were built by Wadi Butler Wood. And so you'll get to walk through the neighborhood, learn about the architecture of Wadi Butler Wood. He is the architect who built the Woodrow Wilson House. So uh, you'll learn a little bit about the architecture and you'll also learn about the people historically who've lived in these houses over the last hundred years. We also promote a, uh, an audio walking tour. This is an audio tour, audio walking tour of uh, the Calorama neighborhood. It is, uh, you can download it. It gives you an idea of uh, the embassies and the historic sites and buildings that are in and around the Woodrow Wilson house. So our hope and goal is that people will take a walking tour, start at the Wilson House, end at the Wilson House, and then come to the backyard to see the Suffrage Outside exhibit. Um, as that goes along, we also have one event that we will be hosting, the first that we're uh, doing at the Wilson House in, since COVID, and that is our Vintage Game Night. Many of you know the Vintage Game Night has been running on the first Wednesdays of every month for the last seven or eight years. Uh, under COVID, we needed to suspend that. We did a few of them online, but we realized that with this beautiful weather and with the ex exhibition in the backyard, that this might be a nice time to have Vintage Game Night outside. So this uh, Wednesday, the first Wednesday uh, in October is next Wednesday. We'll be inviting you to come for Vintage Game Night. I will say tickets are on sale. Uh, they, but they're going quickly. So if you'd like to uh, find a time to come on that Wednesday night, please do. Um, it will be fun. We will be playing croquet in the garden. If you have games you'd like to play, bring them yourself. But uh, there will be croquet and bocce in the yard that we will provide. We might even do uh, croquet Olympics through, through the flags and through the exhibition of suffrage outside. So it should be a very, very fun night. Um, as you know, we also have a speaker event, so we welcome you. We have, uh, the, today is, I believe, the fourth in our second volume of speakers. And so with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator and our speaker. So first we have our moderator today. It, uh, we have Professor, Professor Christopher Smimo. He's from Washington University in St. Louis. He's part of the Department of History, uh, and he is um, a historian uh, of the 20th century United States, 
specializing in social movements, labor, political parties, and public policy. His articles have appeared in the Journal of American History, Labor, and Critical Historical Studies. Smibo's current book project, Making Republicans Liberal, Social Struggle and the Politics of Accommodation in 20th Century America, is under contract at the University of Pennsylvania Press. So welcome, Professor Smibo. And we have our speaker today is Garrett Peck. Now, many of you know Garrett because he is on the advisory council uh, of the Woodrow Wilson House. I lean on him very heavily for many of the things that we do at the Wilson House, and I'm pleased that uh, we can welcome him to talk about his book, uh, A Decade of Disruption. He is the author, uh, public historian, and tour guide in the nation's capital. He leads tours through the Smithsonian Associates and his temperance, temperance tour of prohibition related sites has been featured on C-SPAN, Book TV, and the History Channel program, 10 Things You Didn't Know About, uh, with punk rock legend Henry Rollins. He was featured on a two-hour documentary about prohibition by the Smithsonian Channel. His eighth book, a Decade of Disruption, America in the New Millennium, was published in the spring of 2020. Peck was involved with the DC Craft Bartenders Guild in lobbying the DC City Council to have the Ricky declared Washington's native cocktail in 2011. He researched and pinpointed the Washington Brewery site at Navy Yard and is particularly proud of the Green Hat Gin, uh, which is named after a character Peck wrote about in his book, Prohibition in Washington, DC, a congressional bootlegger, George Cassidy. He has lectured at the Library of Congress, the National Archives, and the Smithsonian Institution, and often speaks about historical societies, literary clubs, and trade associations. Uh, as I mentioned, he's on the board of the Woodrow Wilson House and is a member of the Association of the Oldest Inhabitants of DC. He's a native of California and a graduate of the University, uh, excuse me, Virginia Military Institute and George Washington University and a US Army veteran. So with that, let me tell you a little bit about the book, Decade, Decade of Disruption. Um, I read this book when it came out, it first gave it to me in the galleys it has been amazing. I'm really thrilled that we can have uh, a discussion to both focus on the historical context of the book um, and have uh, Garrett talk about what was happening in this, uh, in this first decade of this new millennium that is just uh, so amazing and then be able to give it some historical context. So with that, I welcome Garrett Peck and Professor Smimo. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and welcome to everyone, and thank you for your support of the Woodrow Wilson House. Um, again, I'm Garrett Peck, and uh, um, uh, Kit and myself will be chatting, uh, it'll be conversation around the recent history and what it all kind of means, especially for our current moment in time. Uh, I've got a few slides. I know people like to see pictures, so I did put together a quick deck, so let me share my screen. I will say just a quick little flashback here to what she mentioned here about uh, what Elizabeth mentioned about uh, punk rock legend Henry Rollins. So who's actually from DC and uh, we gave him a tour of the Woodrow Wilson house and took him down in fact down to the wine cellar. So we were doing this whole program about, <laughs> about prohibition. So that was one of my cooler moments in my life. So <laughs> haven't had too many of those this year here. But anyways, the, uh, the topic of the book itself was uh, it's a history of the first decade of the, of the 20th century and how many disruptive events we lived through in that really disruptive decade. And of course, we're going through this massive disruption right now. I, I would say COVID-19 is probably the, the, the mother of all disruptions because it's affected every single person in the world. So it's just really remarkable. And uh, so we'll, we'll be talking about that. We'll talk about current trends and of course, a key theme that, that, that the Professor Spimo and I will have to talk about, which is resiliency. Yes, right now the pandemic sucks. I mean, it's not fun. <laughs> We're all under lockdown and so on, but it's not forever. You know, it's, it's for now. And so we're gonna talk about what makes for a resilient society and a real resilient individual, because out of every crisis we've ever had, there's always been a catharsis afterwards. That's not being a prophet. It's simply just study history and you'll see that always happens. Like after the Civil War, after World War II, et cetera. There's always a movement towards change afterwards because things are always different afterwards. So I'm gonna show you, oops, I gotta click forward here real quick. There we go. There's the Woodrow Wilson House, our, our host here for the day. <laughs> um, 
The moment in history right now, and Kit can certainly comment on this as well, um, we are in a really unique moment in history. Yes, we've had other pandemics throughout human history, but this one in particular, I think the cathar one of the catharses is already here. Um, and you see that this is dead right downtown, right by the White House, the Black Lives Matter Plaza. And, you know, May 25th, when George Floyd was killed, that really kicked off Black Lives Matter has been a movement really since 2013, but this time it really does feel different. And I think that's in part because of we have a much stronger sense of what's going on in society, that people of color have been much more mar marginalized in our society. Uh, so many people have been home because of the pandemic, and you've also seen a lot more different groups besides just African Americans joining in with, with the protests and the marches. So, you know, I, I feel like this time really is different from other times in our history around social reform movements. So we shall see. And Kit, what do you, what do you, what do you think about all of this here at this moment? No, I think that's a, that's a really good introduction. And I think something that, um, you know, we certainly need to keep in mind about, you know, clearly these, a protest like Black Lives Matter is on the one hand, not necessarily unique. Um, obviously in the long, uh, the long history of freedom struggles um, in the United States, um, and even before its founding. But there is, I think, yeah, something, uh, there is something unique about the, the way in which Black Lives Matter emerges alongside um, other overlapping and interlocking crises. Uh, of course, COVID-19 and um, the, you know, the deep social and economic um, ramifications and consequences of that. Um, all of that, of course, unfolding in the, we're still in the long aftermath of 2008, right? A central point in, um, in Garrett's book that we'll be talking about more in a moment too. But right, having these, having these crises unfold just as um, this, in effect, I suppose, the, the, the freedom movement of the 21st century, coalescing around Black Lives Matter, um, has taken on that much more urgency. Um, and in many ways has found much more fertile ground uh, to begin pressing for far more transformative um, reckonings with you know, the varieties of forms of systemic and institutional oppression that exist in the US. Um, but also of course, thinking about the ways in which much like freedom movements in the past, what Black Lives Matter is confronting is also opening up new possibilities, uh, new possibilities for you know, quite, quite profound change uh, in the United States. Um, and if anything, those possibilities maybe are even more profound given how much COVID is likely, likely perhaps certain, uh, to fundamentally transform our day-to-day -day lives um, in the weeks, months, years going forward. And yeah, the pandemic is certainly going to be a transformative event, I think. We're certainly seeing it with the economy and, uh, and around the social movement as well. Um, and I really do think that we would not have this iteration of BLM had it not been for the pandemic. It's, it really is a huge catalyst for it. Um, we've been through other pandemics before in our history. Uh, you might have heard of like the bubonic plague back in the Middle Ages and so, and so on. And of course, you know, just over 100 years ago, we had uh, the quote, Spanish flu of 1918, which was really quite deadly. Um, uh, this is a really famous photo, and I thought it was so cool when I was looking at it again, that it's in St. Louis, which is where Kit is right now. So <laughs> these were Red Cross volunteers uh, working during the pandemic. So I would say a hugely disruptive event during another huge disruption, which was World War I. This was during the final battles of the war. We had this horrible pandemic and 675,000 Americans died during it. And uh, once the war was over, the pandemic ended, and we had our catharsis after the war was over. And we saw more in the years afterwards, uh, obviously 1929 with the Great Depression. And, uh, and, and that generation, by the way, I think you know, why Americans so love the great, what we call the greatest generation, the World War II generation, you know, they kind of came of age during the Depression. They got this double whammy of both having to live and survive through the Great Depression and then had to go fight World War II. And so that generation had just a remarkable amount of social cohesion in their lives. And so I just put up a quick photo I thought was really cool. Um, I used this for another class, <laughs> uh, showing just kind of the American ingenuity of loaning up, of, of uh, putting B-25 bombers on the USS Hornet to go bomb Japan <laughs> during the darkest days of World War II. You know, and we came out of the war, just, you know, the country was really transformed from that. So again, crisis leads to catharsis afterwards. There's always a change afterward. And so that's really what I wanted to kind of focus on through my book. Uh, a decade of disruption. Um, 
Kit, would you, would you agree with me that the first, the 9-11 was really the most disruptive event of the first decade? I think, yeah, I think something about 9-11 as a, certainly as a marker, right? Even that, even just how, uh, how that date has entered our popular imagination, just our popular lexicon in terms of how we define and, and demarcate um, a distinction between, you know, say, say, not just the 1990s, but really the 20th century. And I think as you were just mentioning earlier, Garrett, the, the 20th century um, defined by a kind of Pax Americana, um, an America defined by you know, emerging uh, ultimately from the crisis of the depression, emerging from the global conflict of, well, two world wars in fairly rapid succession um, and creating a particular order, right? A particular way of organizing society, thinking about politics, uh, consuming and producing goods, right? All of these things connect in a way that defined 20th century United States as right, something that we could historically identify as a period. So yeah, I think you're right. 9-11 emerges as um, certainly a date that we can pinpoint as a break between mm -hmm. that kind of 20th century Pax Americana, which is I think something, again, a theme that comes up in, um, in your book, right? And making this, you know, this distinction that it's not um, uh, that it's not an end of history moment that comes out at the end of the 20th century, but in fact, the unfolding um, of, a new, of a new world and a new order. Um, mm -hmm. And one that perhaps you know, maybe coincidentally happens to fall rather neatly in terms of you know, defining a century or a decade. Um, but nevertheless, a, a, key, a key moment in reorganizing and remaking and remapping what what you know, everything from politics to day-to-day -day life in the United States would look like moving forward. Yeah. It's funny, I, you know, speaking of history, I, you know, I put this in my book, this, this reminder of how like after the Cold War ended and the Soviet Union collapsed, and we're all talking about at that time, like, oh, hey, history is over. And <laughs> of course, history is never over. <laughs> so new events, of course, happened and you know, things that continue to transform our society and, and us will can, and will continue to happen. You know, history is never over. So um, I think another key disruptive event, of course, was the Iraq War. And it was so interesting. I remember this discussion around, around we kind of re rushed towards the war itself. And then, of course, most of society sort of organized and said, OK, yeah, sure, we want to support our troops and so on. And it's interesting, you look at it afterwards, once we couldn't find the weapons of mass destruction. I think this is one of the few things that the, both the left and the right agree on today, which was that this war was a huge mistake. And it really didn't advance. American interests at all. In fact, okay, Saddam Hussein was really a bad person, but that left Iran unchecked because he was the main bulwark against uh, against the Iranian regime. So it's kind of a lot of unintended consequences that came about from that particular war. And um, I just put up here for uh, you know this famous photograph of George W. Bush here on the aircraft carrier Abraham Lincoln with the mission accomplished sign behind him, and we were all like, yeah, that was heavily obviously used against him afterwards because. The mission clearly was just starting. So, and in fact, the Iraq war, I would say it still probably isn't even over given that there's still ISIS that's still out there and, and so on, it's, it's a mess. And we kind of, you know, we opened up Pandora's box when we invaded the country. Yeah, um, yeah, we're still in Afghanistan, by the way, and that's our nation's longest war we've ever been in. So, uh, yeah, 18 plus years now, amazing. I think it maybe was a clear distinction between say the second world war or even the relatively brief um, involvement of the United States in the first, um, in which it's in a way these conflicts, right, these military expeditions, were in many ways most, and many Americans could be effectively insulated from the conflicts, right? The day, you know, their own, their own personal experiences were not impacted by, say, rationing, um, you know, in the kind of ways that total mobilization transformed uh, U.S. society, say, in the 1940s, right? So there's another element, too, to think about how, right, these are protracted, ongoing, right, in the case of Afghanistan, uh, a war that is still um, involving U.S. troops, but one that in many ways could be effectively um, detached from many people's day-to-day -day lives. And yeah. so it's thinking about how, you know, how this new century, right, this new era of American foreign policy, um, how it could be organized in that way um, without necessarily being directly, um, you know, without being directly you know, mobilizing and involving you know, all citizens in the conflict. Yeah.
Yeah, it's interesting today. I, I, I have a, I served in the military and I went to a military college and you know, I have you know, classmates who had nine, 10, 11 combat deployments. It was like the same people being sent over and over and over again, while the rest of the country, to use a bad metaphor, met, a bad metaphor went shopping. You know, most people had no contact with, with veterans or with people who were actually fighting th these wars or how, how difficult it is for the people to be sent over and over and over again and the mental difficulties and psychological difficulties that, that comes with all that. Because war is, war is definitely a traumatic experience. And the way it worked, right, the transition from, you know, from a ending, you know, ending the draft as a way to, as conscription as a way to enlist society at large um, and right, relying on a volunteer-based military um, to conduct, um, right, to conduct these expeditions, right, to conduct these conflicts. Yeah. Um, of course, right, as you say, you know, puts the burden squarely on you know, a very specific segment, a very specific class of Americans, overwhelmingly. Yeah. Um, real quickly here in the, in the book, I wrote a whole chapter. One of my favorite chapters in the book is called The National Pastime. Um, that doesn't refer to baseball, but rather to the internet and surfing the net, which is <laughs> now like our, our favorite new national pastime. And so I looked at all the disruptive nature of the internet itself, you know, like initially how we were all like, oh, yay, the internet back in the 1990s when we all got 1995 or so, we got our first email addresses. And then people started coming up with business models to, uh, to build businesses on the internet, which proved to be incredibly disruptive for so many other business models, say newspapers or bookshops and et cetera. So it's, uh, it's been a great gift for us, but it's also of course a, a huge source of misinformation and disinformation in our society. Not to mention as well, the loss of privacy. Like we've just handed it right over on the silver platter, right over to, to Amazon and, and, uh, and Facebook and Google and other companies. So it's, it's kind of amazing how, what the internet has led to. One question, well, is a question I actually had for you, Garrett. Um, that you know, extends to the, actually, you know, right to the title of your book, um, right, A Decade of Disruption. And you know, to me, in reading this and thinking about it, you know, and certainly what you're talking about here with you know, uh, the disruption of certainly uh, you know, disruptive business models you know, of Silicon Valley, to what extent is disruption, should we think of it as, you know, obviously it's, it's a common word, but one that takes on very specific meaning in the first decade of the 20, 21st century and continues to in our, in our world. So how might we think of this as you know, a word that its very meaning is transformed for people living in our time in the way that say containment takes on a very specific meaning in say Cold War America of the 1950s. Um, so yeah, I'm just curious like what, what you might think about how we should think of disruption itself as almost taking on a new meaning um, in this first decade of the 21st century. Yeah, yeah, it's a really interesting point or an interesting question. The, yeah, disruption, if anything, it feels like they're coming faster and faster and faster and faster, <laughs> just as, as in the digital economy that we're living in, uh, it's, it's easy for someone to go out and build a new mousetrap and overturn an old business model. And uh, that's kind of what we're living through. I mean, look at the poor taxi companies, you know, they've been all disrupted heavily by Uber and Lyft. But yeah, a simple app came out there and just like, boing, okay, no one's taking taxis anymore because Uber and Lyft are cheaper and more readily available. So. Certainly, I mean, disruption is good in some ways, but also a lot of ways it's bad because it's, it, it makes a lot of people insecure, financially insecure especially. And then you have something like, like the pandemic <laughs> where we've all been disrupted. So it's, it's, everyone's been impacted here by this thing. So um, another big disruption here, I'll, uh, I wanna get to the Q&A here, but uh, kind of, I'll go through the next series of slides here fairly quickly here. Uh, but uh, talking about the, the massive disruption of Hurricane Katrina, which was 15 years ago. And of course, we just had another hurricane came through there about a month ago. And unfortunately, went to the west of Hurricane Katrina, but it hit Lake Charles pretty hard, uh, Louisiana, near the Texas border. And I always look at what happened with Katrina. I, I think that was one of those few moments, uh, initial moments in the 21st century, where Americans really woke up, they opened their eyes to the fact that there was huge racial and class differences in our society. The fact you had about 100,000 people stuck in New Orleans, overwhelmingly African-American, they were stuck because they couldn't afford to have an automobile. And they got trapped inside this drowned city. And you know, we all saw the footage from the, from the helicopters and from CNN looking at, uh, at the Superdome and um, at the convention center, just realizing what a, what a humanitarian disaster Hurricane Katrina led to. And then of course you fast forward 15 years later and you think, 
okay, how much things have, have things gotten better for African Americans in our country, especially economically, have they gotten better? Um, I would probably say overall, really not, especially given the Great Recession, which followed on a few years later, which led to a massive number of people losing their homes. And that was another huge dislocation of people. So um, yeah, definitely another big <laughs> disruptive event here and a very tragic one here as well. Uh, the Great Recession, I think next to 9-11, that is probably the biggest disruption of the, of, the, of, the, of the first decade of the 20th century. And let's not forget, it was led by the housing bubble burst. <laughs> so, and I think kind of looking into our own time right now, yes, we're in a deep recession, but I don't think we're going into a depression over the, over the pandemic, but certainly we're in a big re recession. Um, we nearly went over the cliff in 2008. I mean, we came that close if the Fed hadn't stepped in and the Treasury Department. Um, looking back then, you know, the, the banks had pushed out uh, subprime as, as a big way to finance for, for new people in the housing market, but largely people who could not have, have afforded to buy a house before, but also couldn't afford to pay the, the loan back. And that's where the trouble lay. And so when all these people began defaulting, the banks got into trouble by 2007, and then that led to then this huge toxic mess, which spread throughout uh, the summer of 2008 and the fall as well. Um, and to, for me, that's probably the most shocking part of the book uh, when I wrote it. I was actually just taking notes, reading the newspaper every day and writing down where the stock market was, what the Fed was doing, what actions they were taking, and how the stock market would keep collapsing and collapsing. I mean, you just sense this panic in the fall of 2008. I mean, we, like I said, we nearly went over the cliff. We nearly had another Great Depression. Um, nothing like what we're going through today. This is definitely a, a huge downturn, but uh, I, I think 2008 was a lot worse so overall. You heard Alan Greenspan, <laughs> who was the, the man at the Federal Reserve, who basically allowed the, the banks to, to continue on with, uh, with what they were doing with subprime, rather than really regulating them heavily over the question. And then, of course, I think this amazing thing happens right during the middle of the meltdown. Y'all yeah, remember this, this is you know, 12 years ago, but uh, Barack Obama is elected right during this. And historically, he's one of, so far, I think three presidents we've had who've kind of parachuted in right during the middle of a, of a crisis. Um, one being Abraham Lincoln with the secession crisis. Number two being Franklin Roosevelt, who had to parachute in right during the middle of the Great Depression. In fact, during the worst part of the Great Depression. And then Obama gets elected right as the market is heading down. So he basically has to catch a, a falling knife. And uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, not a really enviable task. And right during the same period, during the winter and spring of 2009, we had a pandemic. Right. Oh, that's true. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> It was the uh, the bird flu, the um, so the H1N1. Yeah, it, it's kind of amazing. It's um, and the Obama administration handled it very very well. You know, we kind of handled it like the Europeans have handled this one, and so it never made huge headlines. We did not have a lot of people die from it. Um, and I will actually give George the George W. Bush administration a lot of credit because they actually created the national pandemic plan in 2005. And so when Obama came in, they basically just broke the glass, pulled up the plan, and executed against it. And they did it, I think, nearly flawlessly. And I still remember a year later getting my the vaccine for it. They came up with a vaccine for it. And, and uh, yeah, we don't get a whole lot of press about, <laughs> about, about the 2009 pandemic because it, it wasn't a huge big deal. It's, and it's easy to forget, certainly alongside the, the, uh, you know, the impending collapse of, of global capitalism, right? So there's a way in which the, uh, right, the scope and scale of that of that pandemic ultimately, right? Even again, sort of, we think about our historical memory of it, um, it tends to tends to pale in comparison. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A um, couple more slides here. We'll get to Q and A. Um, I think one of the things that uh, obviously a, a hugely disruptive uh, social movement that or and political movement that erupted within two weeks after Barack Obama was sworn in was the Tea Party, and uh, this is basically a complaint party, a populist movement that had really only one goal, which was to stop whatever legislative agenda Obama wanted to have. Their, their job was to throw their shoes into the machine and stop it. And that was pretty much it. So, um, and it kind of paves the way for a lot of what we saw in 2016 with, uh, I think the transition of the Republican party to the party of Trump. Um, the Tea Party kind of set the stage for a lot of that. This, you know, this populist revolt, which really started in 2009. Um, in part, it was framed, as a revolt against the, the, the bailouts. There were a lot of people on the right who were really upset by the fact that we rescued the banks. But I think there was also a racial aspect of this, the, the fact that we just elected the very first African-American to be president. 
And of course, earlier in 2008, the Commerce Department had issued this report saying that by about the year 2044, we would be a nation of minorities. In other words, white people will now be less than 50% of the population. And for especially working class whites, that's a big deal. It's a kind of a, you know, cue the freak out over the fact that, you know, that's, it's lost status for, for, for those people. And of course the Tea Party spawns a counterweight, which I don't think was nearly as effective, but if you remember this, well, Occupy Wall Street, um, yeah, there were no Occupy candidates who were ever like elected to the House of Representatives, unlike say the Tea Party. <laughs> so I'm not really certain what the outcome is. I don't give Occupy Wall Street a whole lot of credit because it was a protest movement. I remember them occupying both Wall Street and also McPherson Square downtown. And after a while, we we're all like, hmm, why are you guys still here? What's your message? You know, there was no legislation that came about from it or anything. It was a sort of anti-capitalist and et cetera, but it kind of just fizzled out over time. Oh, no, I was going to say, I mean, one thing we can see is um, perhaps a loose, but I think there are some strong connections, certainly from Occupy to, um, right, to the Sanders campaign in 2016 and 2020, right, and mobilizing um, right, the array of candidates who also um, are elected, of course, subsequently been elected and um, are continuing uh, to win office um, broadly around um, a set of policy goals and critiques um, that can be seen as having been reignited. Um, by the Occupy Wall Street movement. So I think that is one thing that we can see as, a, um, you know, as, a, as, a, as, an, as an aftershock, as an after effect, you know, even as Occupy specifically perhaps um, as a leaderless movement disperses, uh, but nevertheless puts, I think, ideas back into um, you know, the political conversation and to reignite political mobilizations that um, in many ways had been uh, dormant or defeated for perhaps the past several decades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And of course, we get to the ultimate disruptor of all, <laughs> Donald Trump, so, who basically took over the, uh, the party of Ronald Reagan. And now I'd say it is, in fact, the party of Donald Trump. And, uh, and even if, if Trump is, uh, if he's rejected the polls here coming up in five weeks, I think the GOP will remain the party of Trump for a long time, just as it was the party of Reagan for four, de for, for, for four decades afterwards. So Trumpism, I think, will be with us for a while, I, I think, um, until the GOP comes up with a new message or a new base. You know, so we'll see here over time. Again, I don't have a crystal ball, but based off of history, <laughs> um, you know, these things tend to stick around for a while afterwards. So a key topic that uh, Kit and I wanted to talk about, which is resilience. This idea, yeah, we sh we've shared a lot of bad news with you here today, but let's talk about some of the better news. You know. Yeah, we're kind of on the pit of this. Well, I like to view it actually as a bridge. Um, you're looking at, uh, I was listening to NPR a couple of weeks ago and they started calling the time before March the before time. And that was so interesting. That's now become this thing, the before time. And then of course we have the future time and, and uh, we have to still get there. So we're kind of on this bridge right now. And I'd say, depending on how fast they can get the vaccine deployed and manufactured, et cetera, that we, might be around the halfway point of the pandemic, maybe, we'll, we'll see. But uh, in the meantime, we all have to be resilient. And so I wanted to look at some, some ways here to remind you all, hey, we're all, just, we're all not just helpless, but in fact, we all have to adapt and evolve and find new ways of paying the bills and supporting our, our favorite organizations and making sure that your neighbors are okay as well, as well as you know, making sure that society can also be resilient and, and bounce back from this. Again, wherever there's been a crisis, there's always a catharsis afterwards. And I think certainly with the BLM movement that we've seen uh, certainly late this last spring, that's part of, of at least one of the probably several catharsis that will come about. But uh, let's give you some other examples, I think, of resilience. And I, I wanted to point out here, first off, the Woodrow Wilson house. Obviously, it's not safe right now to have people come in for house tours for obvious reasons. Um, you know, but we, well, we, Elizabeth came up with this fantastic idea about making a safe exhibit so whereby people could come outdoors. And that's like, Eureka, you know, being outside is fairly safe because you have the wind, et cetera, the air, air currents moving, limited number of people. And so she organized a, an exhibit that was planned to be indoors, but now it's outdoors and there it is. So again, just a quick little example of institutional resiliency, a way of being able to continue their mission around some very trying circumstances. I mean, all these arts organizations and culture organizations, historical, et cetera, are just you know, trying to survive right now. But here's one of those ways 
that really can, can help make a big difference. So um, I put down here another big list here of, of other ways, and uh, we can talk about some of these things here that are uh, that I think are really important that are that represent community resilience. So uh, Kit, have you voted here already? Uh, I will be. Uh, it's a uh, it's much more difficult to vote in Missouri, um, but there will be there'll be some early voting options. So I'll be taking advantage of that in the next couple of weeks. Cool, great to hear. Um, I voted a week and a half ago, the day that Virginia opened up uh, early balloting. So I went over to courthouse in Arlington and stood in line with about two hundred people. And <laughs> so, yeah, certainly voting. You know, the, the civic engagement behind that uh, is super, super important, especially this this being this being an election year, and of course the direction of the country. Um, it's a way to, to change things ultimately. Um, so have you gotten your flu shot? I've got my flu shot. Yeah, excellent. So you get a gold star for this day. <laughs> um, I, I, again, resilience oftentimes it's not just about the individual, but it's about the community. You know, how do we all together, it's like wearing your mask. It's not just about you, but wearing your face, I should have put that on here, but wearing your face mask in these days is about protecting all the people you're gonna come around because you might have the coronavirus and not know it, given how many asymptomatic people there are out there. Out there. So by wearing your mask, you're protecting the broader community around you. Same thing with a flu shot. Yes, uh, I've had the flu once in recent years and it was nasty. Like, ooh, stayed home for 10 days. But like having that flu shot gives you protection both for yourself and also everyone around you because that way you're not spreading the virus. And I put a couple other things on here as well, but uh, Kit, do you, do you have some other ideas about resilience? Well, you know, one thing I was, you know, I have a question too, and to go along with, you know, the theme of our day and something, you know, I know we want to, we want to talk about is what, you know, thinking about, of course, disruption, thinking about disruption as certainly a, a historical reality, but also a, oftentimes a very historically specific thing, like what is being disrupted. But I think likewise, we want to think about, and want to ask you too, and the, for all of us to think about what does, right, what does resilience mean? And I think, right, the examples you're putting here suggest that it's, Right, it's it's community building. It's finding ways to establish some kind of solidarity, but it also poses a question about does resilience simply mean persisting, right, bouncing back? But is there an element of you know, to what extent can resilience also be transformative, right? Especially when we're thinking about um, the Black Lives Matter movement, right? To what extent is resilience also about fundamentally remaking the world that we live in? So I guess that's a, that's a question I think I'd like to put out there for us to think about, right? What do we what do we think of when we when we say resilience? What does that conjure? What does that mean? Yeah, it's it's a really good point. Um, and yeah, I was thinking about you know that that bridge metaphor I had that we're on this bridge to what's next, and you know where we were in February, we can't go back. The old world is gone. You know the bridge is kind of burning down behind us, and we can only keep moving forward ultimately. So yeah, whether it's persistence whether it's the, the bounce back nature of resilience or you know, pushing forward towards social change and political change. You know, those are all really key points, I think. And you know, things will be different once this pandemic is over. There's so many things that are going to be different, whether it's work. You know, the huge question here around race relations in our country that the George Floyd killing uh, brought up, you know, that's gonna be, I think, a really transformative moment in our, in our nation's future political history, I think. Right. So I think, yeah, this poses, I think, yeah, these are the questions we want to ask. We want to think about, right, resilience as, you know, in some ways it can mean, it can also mean things like muddling through. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've seen that as a historical trend and, and perhaps something that we'd see even in our moment. Um, but what does seem to be unique about, you know, this decade coming um, in the wake of, you know, the decade that you talk about in your book, um, it suggests that muddling through is not, um, is not quite the option uh, that it may have been in other moments, right? We do seem to be at um, at a moment of profound change, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what that change is precisely going to look like, obviously, we can't say yet. But I think we can say with some confidence that this will be seen as a right, as some kind of a breaking point, right? The old world is, as you said before, in some places, quite literally burning behind us. Um, so, right, but what is that? What's that going to look like, and how can we ultimately? We are, we're all historical actors in our own right. So, right, so what can we do uh, to intervene, right? And to, make, and to make history, right? And to make the history that is going to you know, redefine the world that we live in. So I think that's something too, to think about with resilience as you know, acknowledging our own, our own agency, our own capacity to act, to organize, 
um, and to come together with one another. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, it's, and it's, it's interesting with the pandemic, of course, because <laughs> we do, I think, in a lot of ways, have a lot of solidarity around this. I mean, when people are wearing their masks in public, et cetera, but at the same time, of course, we can't gather together. So that, that makes a big challenge because, you know, we can't go to a rally safely, really. People do go to rallies and stuff, but it's, you know, I watch it on the news and I always kind of cringe a little bit, like, oh no, you know. <laughs> so, uh, it, and I recognize it is harder. A lot of, I imagine a lot of people do feel like they're muddling through, especially given how long this pandemic is lasting. We're now in month seven of it. And we, you know, again, we might be at the halfway point, but the flip side is I think we've gotten pretty good at doing this. Like we, we realized, Hey, you know what? I can survive this. Uh, I, I figured out how to be a resilient person. I figured out how to work together with my organizations and support the causes I like, you know, it's kind of inventing on the fly, but we've kind of managed how to do it. So I do give everyone a pat on the back for that. Cool. Um, I will point on here real quickly, uh, just about food banks. Um, just to, if you are, I, I work for a nonprofit and just seeing how, many, how high the unemployment rate is. And even with our own country, by the way, how many people are, are food insecure. So if you, I think that's a great way to help out within your community is to donate to a food bank. Because that ensures that people around you who are currently unemployed, not by choice, but rather because they can't work because of the, the, the pandemic, um, this ensures that they get, get to eat as well. So I'm, I'm a big supporter here of, of food banks themselves. This is a fascinating story and fascinating, interesting. So history is not over. It's, uh, this is Elizabeth, I've jumped back in. Sarah, if you give me the video, I think uh, as my host, you need to um, allow me to jump back in on the video. But while you do, we have some questions that have come in. Uh, the first is, um, are the, well, the first thing I wanted to say actually is a statement and that is, when I think of the first decade, I think of um, Y2K and I think of the preparation we had of Y2K and it went on and on like how would we prepare for our vehicles that might have been made in Germany and were they going to be six hours ahead of us in terms of you know complete crash down or meltdown of our cars and I so I think somewhat of technology as um, as the beginning of the decade and almost we were preparing ourselves. And I wondered historically, were there something that we, that, that people were able to brace themselves for, or they knew something was coming, it might not have been as big as they were expecting, um, but it was coming and they were able to brace themselves. So historically, Professor, is there something that we could turn to to say that happened? Right. Yeah, that's that's a really that's a that's a that's a compelling point to think about in this right. The Y two K was this was the thing that was supposed to right, shut down right. industrial society and at, at, at the stroke of midnight, and it doesn't happen. But nevertheless, there are all of these you know, preparations taken. You know, one thing that you know, comes to mind, and perhaps you know, it's not. Um, you know, I suppose similarly might be you know the closest thing maybe in sort of maybe perhaps in twentieth century United States history would be. You know, the relationship of the United States um, to war making, right? Something like the Cold War, right? Preparations for, um, right, for a nuclear attack, right? A kind of civil defense apparatus, fallout shelters, all of these things that are prepared with the, you know, with the expectation of the threat that this could, that all life could be similar, could be annihilated. Um, so I think that's one area. So I think there's something different, right, about Y2K in that it is, right, it's not organized around around war or the threat of war making or the threat of you know, that kind of you know, annihilation, but a, but a different kind, recognizing that there is this kind of connection, this kind of interconnectivity that all of these circuits um, are fundamentally bound together and potentially have this fatal glitch <laughs> at the center of it all. Uh, it's interesting, the other thing, and this is also on a personal level, at the time of the bird flu, I worked for, in fact, a defense contractor. And the amount of work that we that went into preparing for that potential epidemic, uh, you know, there were, that particular company, there are 140,000 employees, and the mobilization to, to prepare for that potential epidemic was huge. I mean, we had all it was mission critical, 140,000 employees all worked towards preparing for something that, of course, as you pointed out, didn't really affect us. But the way we prepared, and this is just, uh, you know, by uh, my own story, is that the way that they had that company prepared pushed us into a new technology that we never would have used, which was basically going, um, creating a company that was paper free. 
and preparing ourselves for the world that we're living in today where everything's online, you didn't need papers. Um, to run an office. So I think historically in my own, you know, that was one, Y2K, they, they had me brace for it and nothing happened. And then the avian bird flu, they had me prepare for it. And although nothing much happened, it really propelled my own personal work business and my own personal uh, way of organizing my life to be online so that when it came to be working in today's environment is, is really not that big of a, not that big of an issue. Um, and going to be, you know, we're all we're all remote. So if I can, I've got some questions. The first is, are the disruptions that we have experienced larger than in the past, or do they just seem more frequent? When one looks at past dis disruptions, such as the depression, polio, smallpox, the world wars, they seem as large as anything we're experiencing now. And in fact, in the 30 years from 1916 to 1945, there may have been more disruptions and more serious disruptions than we've seen over the past 30 years. So the question is, was it, are we facing more disruptions now? Are they larger and more impactful or was it, uh, what did we see a century ago? Mm. It's, a, it's a really interesting question. Um, I, I would say the disruptions of course were happening all the time back then and certainly like disease outbreaks because there were no shots, anything like that. So that was a huge factor. I mean, remember people lived about three decades shorter than they live now. So. Uh, you're far less likely today to die of a disease or get in an industrial accident uh, or die in war, you know? So there, in that sense, it's, it, we live in a far better time than then. Uh, I think one of the things that it feels like we're just in a crisis all the time in, in part is because of the information we get. And especially like with the rise of the internet means that we're constantly bombarded, you know, with a seven by 24 news cycle. So oftentimes it can feel like what's the daily crisis or crises as the case is. I think disruption has always been there since, you know, since man was created, you know, in Africa 150,000 years ago or whatever. You know, there's always been climate change. Uh, there's always been food shortages, disease, et cetera. And we've always had to adapt around it. I actually just read an article this morning in, in today's paper about uh, the cycle of news and talking about this and that uh, although we didn't, news did not travel as fast, there were many, you would have a news cycle, you would have a, a print of a paper would come out you know, three, four, five, six times a day, there would be uh, a new edition. So um, there might have, it might not have traveled as fast, but there was more news being published. Mm -hmm. um, next question, resilience generally means the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. And in the medical areas, clearly the world is more resilient than it was a century ago or even 30 years ago. But politically, it's less clear. With the results of the 2020 election to be an important indicator of our country's ability to recover from the unexpected results of the uh, 2016 election. So I guess that's really a question. Um, is it clear? Will the results of this 2020 election be an important indicator of our country's ability to, uh, to be resilient? Well, I think it certainly speaks to the question of um, what is the capacity of, I suppose, you know, most basically America's political institutions, right, to continue to reproduce themselves in the way that they have um, fairly consistently for um, 240 years. <laughs> yeah, with, yeah, I mean, obviously with, um, you know, significant, I mean, obviously we're facing, um, yeah, I think a, a crisis probably not unlike um, certainly probably 1876, um, that election. Um, in some ways, the, the, uh, the obvious comparison would be, say, the, the 2000 election, which you know, goes to the Supreme Court, but with, again, as we've been talking about today, with a kind of compounding and interlocking um, you know, conflicts and crises, a question of how this, you know, how this election is in fact going to be handled, um, what kind of, you know, if there is a transition of power, um, right, that does seem to be, right, there seems to be something different about that that harkens back to other moments um, such as, right, the, you know, the contested election of 1876 is one that I think we've seen people frequently um, now referencing as perhaps a, um, maybe the closest analog to what we're, what we're, what we're potentially confronting in you know, a, a month or so from now. Yeah. Yeah, we shall see. We um, shall see. Um, so the other question is uh, the unprecedented and growing wealth gap. And how does that fit into these narratives of resilience and, and societal change? Sometimes it seems like resilience means that oppressed folks or underpaid workers bear the brunt of the work and the hardship 
day, uh, day to day while carrying the rest of the folks, like something that we see today. How does that play into it? Mm. It's, it's interesting, and I can offer like a personal anecdote here around that. So I, I, I left corporate America about a year and a half ago, took a buyout, and you know, it was my, I got to go do my dream, which is to, to work at the gig economy. So I'm a tour guide, and I love leading tours and writing books and, and so on. And um, along comes the pandemic, and in March, in about a week, I had all my business for the year canceled. Just like, just got eviscerated. I, I was just stunned. Um, and then really quickly, I landed a job at a nonprofit. But it was like this you know, quick reminder of where we are right now that the gig economy itself, there is no safety net. Now, Congress did step in and they offered benefits to, to people who work in the gig economy. But increasingly, that's a bigger part of our economy, are people who essentially are contractors and who don't have health, health benefits and so on. So we're definitely seeing that skewing. It's kind of how the economy is turning. Uh, a lot of businesses don't want to hire people, so they hire contractors instead because they can see to to to, to um, to get rid of them if they don't need to keep them on and, and, and so on. So, and we are certainly at a point right now looking at the, at the, at, at the wealth gap. You know, we, we're about where we were in the 1920s right now, which was one of the widest gaps between the rich and poor ever. Um, and there's some factors in there. I don't want to get political about that here today, but <laughs> uh, yeah, and it, it does seem like it's, it is widening right now. Like there is one group that is capturing ever more than national wealth and then there's everyone else who isn't. Yeah, I think that's, that's, a, that's a really crucial question. And I think it, uh, at, at stake, right, is right, who, right, who bears the costs um, and who bears the burden. But at the same time, thinking about this as a transformative moment, right, to what extent is that trend um, right, that we've been seeing for you know, certainly escalating in the period that, uh, of Garrett's book. Um, but right, to what extent is this decade going to you know, be a moment where that is confronted and reckoned with? So I think that's something we have to also keep in mind at what what does what does this resilience mean, and what, and who, what does it mean for uh, for different people? I have to say, uh, before um, I, maybe ten, maybe five years ago, the word disruption was very a hot word in business. Like, oh, is it disruptor, and is it, and you that looked like a very favorable thing. <laughs> and then the other word was pivot. Those were the two. Those were two buzzwords you would use in business. Uh, it was to be a disruptor in the business place and then to be able to pivot. And I think um, since in this last four years, we're saying no, disruption might, the, re, the word resilience is much more important than the word disruption. <laughs> and that we're looking for, um, I think that they, we see waves where we want some stability after the fact, uh, after we go through this. And the question of resilience, and I mean, you hear TED Talks all the time on grit and resilience and what, what it takes to survive having that grit and resilience. So, um, And I also wanted to point out, thank you uh, uh, for showing the pictures of the Wilson House in the uh, rear garden and the change. That is something we did. Um, uh, it's actually a sad commentary on society, but the things that we look in the museum world and they say that one out of every three small museums will not make it through this pandemic mm -hmm. for the very points you, you the very things you point out is that, uh, you know, there's, there's no business, there's not, there's money, not the money's not coming in. Um, and this is a time we need to really reinvent ourselves to survive. If we're going to be uh, one and three, uh, what's the two and three that survive, it's, we need to change our ways. So I, I thank, thank you for pointing out the Suffrage Outside exhibit. You're welcome. Um, great exhibit. I hope everyone gets a chance. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, the speaker series. Does anybody have any other questions? Can they come in on the, on the line? Um, it is important for us to show this resilience as a museum, a historic site. It's been, it's been a historic site uh, for part of the National Trust for Historic Preservation since 1961. And it's, it's stood the test of time of this, the Woodrow Wilson House stood the test of time of people coming and using the house for as a gathering place, as a community, uh, cornerstone of the community, um, as, a, as a historic site that is a time capsule from the 1920s. And so it, it has been a change for us to, and shows some resilience of the team and, uh, and the advisory council to say, yes, we would um, make some changes to, to 
to survive this uh, pandemic and open our back gardens and of course online. So again, um, I'd like to thank uh, Garrett Peck and Professor Smemo for a great talk today, really fascinating and um, wonderful to be able to tie uh, historic recent history with the last decade to historic uh, history from the past century. So I, I appreciate both of you tying that together for us and bringing that to the Woodrow Wilson House. Uh, with that, I thank all of you. Sign up for our continued speaker series. And of course, please come visit the suffrage outside or take one of our walking tours. And I look forward to speaking with you all next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.